Hi, English Mariner John Strong. Hi, Anthony Carey, 5th Viscount of Falkland. I would very much like for you to go to Chile and locate the wreck of a Spanish treasure ship for me. Okay. Hey, I found some islands. The English were probably not the first to discover the Falklands, but they were the first to write it down. They found it to be cold, wet, and miserable. Just like home, so they established a colony in 1765, unaware that the French had also discovered the islands and done the same a year earlier. And for a while the two were unaware of each other's existence, until presumably there was an awkward moment where they ran into each other. Then the Spanish showed up and told the French that a couple hundred years earlier the Pope drew a line on a map and said all of this belongs to Portugal and all of this belongs to Spain, and that the island was in Spain's territory and they would like the French to hand over their settlement. Now since the two were good friends and Spain was willing to pay in cash money, the French obliged, but since they were still a little bitter about the recent Seven Years' War thing, they made sure to warn the Spanish not to let those dirty English on the other side of the island take over. So Spain went over to the English and explained, Pope, line on map, Spain's island. And the English said, yeah, right, this is our island. But the Spanish had more guns, so they kicked them off anyway. But then England threatened to go to war. So Spain went to their friends in France and said, hey, it looks like stuff is about to go down. You in on this? And the French minister of war said, yeah, and we'll launch a full-scale invasion of England and party like it's 1066. But then King Louis XV said, one, you're insane, and two, you're fired. Sorry, Spain, we're not ready for a war right now. So Spain had to give the English their settlement back, saying it's still our island, and the English said, no, it's our island. Then some colonists in North America got a bit rowdy, so the English had to leave their settlement to go focus on that, but they left behind a plaque that said this is totally still our island. So the island was in Spanish hands, but then a French guy, no, not that one, that one, turned on the Spanish, took over most of the country, and captured King Ferdinand VII, and in response, the Spanish colonies in South America started vying for independence. So Spain had a little bit on its hands and also had to leave the islands. And for a couple decades, the islands were left uninhabited except for the penguins, some fishermen, and the gauchos, which are basically like cowboys, but cooler and Spanisher. A merchant from Hamburg living in the now independent United Provinces of the Rio de la Plata heard about the feral cattle roaming the Falklands and thought it would be a good way to make some money. So he got permission from both Buenos Aires and the British government to set up trade there as a private venture. Some American ships came down and began hunting whales and seals around the islands, and Vernet wasn't too happy about it. So he asked Buenos Aires for some military assistance in defending the islands, but Buenos Aires said, meh, do it yourself, gave him some weapons, and appointed him governor of the islands. So he seized the US ships and arrested their crews. In response, two things happened. First, America came down and said, nice settlement you have there, would be a shame if someone destroyed it. And then they destroyed it. Second, Britain heard Vernet had been appointed governor, meaning the United Provinces, actually now the Argentine Confederation, were officially claiming the islands as theirs. So Britain showed up and said, hey, didn't you see our plaque? And since they had more guns, they kicked them off the island. And the Falklands remained firmly in British hands for the next century. They officially became a crown colony in 1840. Port Stanley became the island's capital in 1845. The cattle hides from the island weren't worth much, so they imported sheep from Britain in 1851. Japan had isolated itself from the rest of the world for over 200 years until the Americans showed up and said you're gonna trade with us and you're gonna like it. Then the Western powers imposed a bunch of unequal treaties, meaning Japan's economy was bust. Look at this baby. So gentle. So innocent. You'd think this child would grow up to become a good man. An honest man. Well, think again. Hitler was born Adolphus Hitler in 1889 in a small town in Austria-Hungary. His father, Alois Schickelgruber, was born out of wedlock, but eventually changed his name to that of his stepfather, becoming Alois Hitler. Alois was a mid-level Austrian customs officer. Not really rolling in cash, but certainly rolling in women, he married a rich, older lady, but then immediately started having affairs, including one with a much younger house servant. A few years later, he left his sick wife to be with his mistress, but since the Catholic Church didn't allow divorce at the time, he couldn't marry her. So he waited for his old wife to die and had a child in the meantime. Then his wife died, so he married his mistress and had another child, but then his new wife got sick, so he employed his much, much younger cousin Clara to take care of her. Then when his new wife died, he immediately got Clara, his cousin, pregnant and then married her, in that order, you rock star. Clara and Alois had three children together who all tragically died while in infancy. So when the fourth child, Adolf, came along, Clara spoiled him rotten. The Hitlers had two more kids and the family moved around a few times, meaning Adolf had to attend five different elementary schools. Adolf's father was strict, quick to anger, and took most of it out on the eldest son until he had enough and ran away at the age of 14, leaving seven-year-old Adolf to do most of the chores and get berated by his father. They also had no natural resources, so they decided to go get some. They went to war with China to gain a sphere of influence over Korea, and they took a bunch of China's stuff. But then the West said, hey, 
Cut that out. And since Japan couldn't take on the West, they said, okay, I guess we'll just go home. Wait a minute, what are you doing? Taking advantage of a weakened China and setting up spheres of influence. But I was the one who weakened them. We know. And you guys didn't let me have anything. We know. That seems unfair. We don't think so. Okay, see ya. The result was a difficult relationship with his dad while he was super attached to his mother, who worried over him and his health excessively. Hitler did well in school at first. His grades were good and his teachers praised him. He was popular with the other kids and enjoyed gathering them together to play war games. He also loved reading and particularly liked stories about cowboys and Indians. As he grew older though, he started to get into trouble. He was caught smoking once, organized a raid on a local orchard, tormented his pro-Austria religion teacher with symbolic gestures, displaying his allegiance to the idea of united Germanic people under a greater German state in defiance of Habsburg Austria. You know, the usual. All of this enraged Adolf's father, who punished him severely. The area of Austria-Hungary that Hitler lived in was once part of the German Confederation, and many of the people who lived there considered themselves to be German. Adolf tended to just go against whatever his father said, and since his father was an Austrian public official, Hitler got big into German nationalism. This enraged Adolf's father, who punished him severely. Around this time, a family tragedy struck. His six-year-old brother, whom he loved a lot, died of measles when Adolf was ten, and was buried in the cemetery just across from their home. Around this time, neighbors reported a change in the young boy. Strange behaviors such as talking to trees and staying up late staring at the stars from the cemetery walls. He lost interest in religion, and his school grades started to decline, which enraged his father, who punished him severely. It's 1902. A young man by the name of Benito Mussolini moves from Italy to Switzerland to avoid military service. He gets big into socialism, working for trade unions, writing for socialist newspapers, advocating a violent overthrow of European monarchies, the whole shebang. This gets him in a bit of trouble with the Swiss police, so he gets arrested, sent back to Italy, set free, returns to Switzerland, is arrested again, goes back to Italy again, completes his military service after previously avoiding it, and then after a brief stint as an elementary school teacher, he finally returns to work as an avid socialist. It also didn't help that he had just entered high school, and the cool city boys treated him like a rural peasant. He had to repeat a grade and had little interest in most school subjects, instead spending his time reading and drawing, which he was quite good at. One day his father said, Son, someday you'll be a big balls public official like me. And Adolf replied, No father, I'm going to become an artist and soar high above the clouds with the eagles. This enraged his father, but by this time he was an old ass man, so he just sort of let it go and then died of a lung hemorrhage. So Japan thought, screw this, and went to war with Russia, and stunned everyone by actually winning. Then they fully annexed Korea, but they didn't stop there. Hitler just about passed his final semester, and celebrated in the typical way, by getting blackout drunk and wiping his ass with the certificate. However, he didn't take the overall final school exam, instead just dropping out. The now 16-year-old boy was unemployed, without much purpose in life, and for the next three years, he stayed that way. He spent most of his time at the opera with his only friend, August Kubizek. Kubizek later wrote his memories of the young Hitler, and said he was passionately interested in many things, felt he was in many ways better than others his age, was quick to anger just like his father, and an incredible speaker once he was ranting. When he was 18, he said a very sad goodbye to his mother, and went to Vienna to take the entrance exam for art school. He failed. Soon after, he had to return home. His mother was sick, and her health was rapidly deteriorating. Hitler stayed by her side, and when she eventually died, the family doctor said he had never seen someone so overwhelmed with grief as Hitler was. Then Hitler returned to Vienna, still hoping to find a career in the arts, but he never did. Instead, without parental support, Hitler ended up on the streets. Now in his early 20s, he spent a few rough years living in and out of homeless shelters, making what little he could from selling postcards he painted. His speeches and journalistic abilities made him famous among Italian socialists. He was anti-war, so when Italy colonized Libya in 1910, he rioted and got arrested. It's hard to pinpoint exactly when and how Hitler's extreme ideological beliefs formed, but his time in Vienna would have certainly played a role. Anti-Semitism was widespread in the city. The mayor, whom Hitler supported, was an outspoken anti-Semite. There were many right-wing anti-Semitic newsletters, which Hitler took a keen interest in. He bought into the conspiracy theories, and became a firm believer in the idea that there are many races in constant struggle with one another, the purest of which were the German Aryan people, and the worst of which, he believed, were Jews. Since Austria-Hungary was a multi-ethnic empire full of lesser races, Hitler wasn't a fan. So when he was 24, he moved to Munich in Germany to avoid doing military service. And for one more year, he was a drifter on the streets, until something huge happened. The world of 1914, a time of modern technology, culture, and fashion. Truly the height of civilization. Let's have a war. Everyone knew a big war was coming. France wanted some stuff back that Germany had taken from it. Germany wanted to take more of everyone's stuff. And they were building a big sexy navy that was making the British uncomfortable. These two empires thought they were really cool, but lots of different people who lived there didn't think it was so cool. 
and some of them had even been declaring independence with help from Russia. Everyone was talking about each other behind each other's backs, throwing the fact that military technology had come a long way since the last major war, and suddenly everyone was pretty eager to beat each other up. In this area of Austria-Hungary lived some Serbs and Bosnians who hated living in Austria-Hungary. So the Austro-Hungarian Archduke Franz Ferdinand goes there for a nice drive in an open-top car with his car's route published in advance. And that went just about as well as you'd expect. Some assassins were waiting for him along the way and threw bombs at his car. But they missed and blew up some officers behind him instead. So the Archduke goes into hiding, leaves Sarajevo, and the whole war never happens. Except no, the Archduke doesn't leave, but instead goes back out in the open-top car to visit the injured officers in hospital. The driver takes a wrong turn and by sheer coincidence gets stuck beside one of the failed assassins, who shoots him. Austria-Hungary is understandably pissed about all this, and they think the Serbian government had something to do with it, which they might have. So they go to their ally Germany and say, hey Germany, we're going to declare war on Serbia, and Germany is all for that. So Austria-Hungary send a big list of impossible demands to Serbia, and when Serbia refuses, they declare war. Austria-Hungary and Germany are friends, and Serbia is protected by Russia who's friends with France, so they all declare war on each other. Crowds across Europe celebrated the news. Within days, Hitler volunteered for the German army. The war gave him a purpose in life. His fellow soldiers gave him friendship and brotherhood. Despite the horrors of war, Hitler considered it to be the best time of his life. Montenegro joins in too. France and Britain also have a kind of alliance. So when France says, hey Britain, you got my back? Britain is like, maybe. And then they decide to stay out of it, which is great for Germany because Germany has a plan. They know that Russia is so big and clumsy that it will take them a while to get ready for war. So with this guy in charge, Germany will send all its troops into France at lightning speed while Russia's getting ready defeat France, then move all the troops to Russia, and defeat Russia, and then we all speak German and eat Pfeffer Potast every day. Just one problem. France has loads of forts and defenses along its German border, and Germany can't waste any time fighting them, so Germany decides to go around them, through Belgium. Belgium is neutral, but Germany wants to march 750,000 troops through it to get around France's defenses. They're hoping Belgium will just kind of sit down and shut up, but they don't. They fight back. And they're pretty good too, so they slow the Germans down. What's worse is that Britain shows up, and they're pretty pissed that Germany's invading neutral countries. So now Britain declares war in Germany. So Germany push on through Belgium and commit some atrocities along the way. They also wear spikes and sometimes skulls on their uniform. So if you're trying to not look like the bad guys, good job. The Allies have a propaganda extravaganza, and this starts having an influence around the world, notably in America. The US President Woodrow Wilson sees himself as a bit of a Jesus figure and spends most of the war trying to get everyone to just hug it out. But there's also a large population of ethnic Germans living in the United States and when the war first broke out they were like, yay Germany. But now that they're committing atrocities in Belgium, they're less enthusiastic. Let's play Spot the French Soldier. Did you see him? Easy, right? He's wearing a bright blue uniform with red trousers. And do you know who else spotted him easily too? The Germans. So when the French were slowly marching in columns through the countryside, the Germans easily tore them to shreds with their giant guns. All the nations involved in this war went in with an old school war mentality, and all of them had to update their uniforms and tactics a lot during the Great War. Because this war was going to be like nothing anyone had ever seen before. Russia's ready for war, and way earlier than expected. Hey Austria-Hungary, can you get on top of that? Oh yeah, sure, we've got this, nope. So Germany has to send some troops back to the east to defend against the Russians. The chief of staff of the Austro-Hungarian army is this guy, and although he is handsome, he turns out not to be the best military strategist. Austria-Hungary constantly ignores Germany's advice, and then comes running back to Germany whenever they get in trouble. Austria-Hungary even gets its ass kicked by tiny Serbia, who repels all their invasion attempts at the start of the war. It's better news for Germany in the north though, where they almost completely wipe out the Russian second army. Back on the western front, the Germans continue advancing and are in sight of Paris. At this point, anyone would be forgiven for thinking the Germans were going to get that quick victory after all. But then things start to go wrong. The French commander-in-chief knew something had to be done, and he ordered his armies to stop retreating. In the resulting battle, a gap opened up in the German lines. If a gap opens up, the enemy can use it to flank you from the side and behind, so the German armies have to retreat. The Allies launch a counterattack, so the Germans dig into defensive positions. The Allies do the same. Then both sides move north, trying to outflank each other along the way. 
When they reach the sea, they're in a stalemate with trench systems running the whole way from the coast to Switzerland, the beginning of trench warfare on the Western Front. Here's how trench warfare works. Two opposing lines of trenches with no man's land in between. One side would pummel the other with hundreds of thousands of artillery shells, sometimes for days at a time. This had a huge psychological effect on the soldiers, leaving many shell-shocked. Then, the attacking troops would leave their trenches and rush across no man's land, a muddy wet mass of shell craters and barbed wire. The defending trench would unleash machine gun fire on the attackers, inflicting thousands of casualties. The attackers would send wave after wave until either they gave up or the opposing trench was finally overrun. There would be months of fighting and the deaths of thousands in order to gain a few meters or kilometers of land. Living in the trenches was hard work too. Corpses, mud that could swallow you whole, pools of poisonous water, rats, disease, the smell. It's insane that millions of soldiers put up with these conditions and commanders ordered them to do so for years. With both sides stuck in a hard stalemate, they knew this war wasn't going to be about taking territory, but about simply wearing each other down. The Allies had plenty of men to expend from its overseas dominions, and the British also started a naval blockade, so Germany couldn't import stuff, like food. Neither side really wanted a long, grueling war, though, so they both thought of ways to break the deadlock on the Western Front. Idea number one, new frontiers. When the war first broke out, Australia was quick to take German New Guinea. The Allies also quickly jumped on Germany's colonies in Africa, and particularly in German East Africa, locals were enlisted as soldiers and carriers by both sides, leading to a tragic loss of life for the native Africans. Some new combatants entered the war as well. The Allies' new friends were Italy and Japan. Japan was busy building itself an empire, so it was more than happy to take away German islands and colonies in East Asia. He was reportedly a brave soldier and was awarded the Iron Cross, first class. He was also very lucky and had many close encounters with death. Italy actually had an alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary before the war, but after some tense relations, and then the Allies promising to give them some of Austria-Hungary's stuff, they switched sides. And once again, he protested Italy's involvement. But then he thought, wait a minute, this war could bring about the social climate needed to overthrow European monarchies and bring about the socialist revolution everywhere. And suddenly he was pro-war. But his fellow socialists didn't like his new pro-war stance, so they kicked him out of the party. So then he said, you know what? I'm done with socialism. We need something new, not based on class divisions tearing us apart, but based on unity through nationality. We'll conquer the Mediterranean and reunite all Italian peoples, just like the days of the Roman Empire. I'll call it fascismo, and it will guide the Italian nation to greatness. That's all well and good, Mr. Mussolini, but what kind of haircut am I giving you? Let's go with... Bold. Italy opened up a front in the mountains here, but like everyone else, they were stuck in stalemate for most of the war. The Central Powers' new friend was a struggling empire in the Middle East. The Ottomans... Ottoman? The Ottoman were divided on whether to actually join the war or not, since they had been exhausted by the recent Balkan Wars. Some of the politicians who did want to join went off on their own and fired some shells at Russia, and then came back and said, whoops, looks like we're at war now. The Ottoman entry into the war was of particular concern to the British, since the Middle East was full of oil, and Britain wanted all of that oil. First, the Ottomans tried to attack Russia in the Caucasus Mountains, but they weren't prepared for the cold, and many of them froze to death. Then they crossed miles of desert to take the Suez Canal from the British, but that failed too. Then the Allies tried to take the Dardanelles at Gallipoli in a long and hard trench warfare campaign, but that also failed. The Ottomans blamed their initial losses on the ethnic Armenians living within Ottoman territory, and the resulting Armenian genocide led to the deaths of one and a half million people. Then the Germans sent spies into Afghanistan to try to convince the Arab tribes there to rise up in jihad against the British and attack India. But that plan failed, partly because the spies got bored, brewed their own alcohol, and got drunk, which is a bad thing to do in Afghanistan. All these new frontiers hadn't done much to change the war. Aware that the Allies had more men and supplies than them, the Germans knew they had to do something to break the stalemate. Before the war, there was a big conference that set out the rules of modern warfare. No chemical weapons, no killing civilians, Basically, don't be jerks. The Germans held a meeting and decided to be jerks. Zeppelin air raids commenced over British cities. They also started attacking the Allied trenches with chlorine gas, and they used submarines to sink civilian ships. One such civilian ship was the Lusitania, which had 159 Americans on board when it was sunk, further swaying US opinion against the Germans. Not to be completely unfair to the Germans, the Allies also engaged in chemical warfare soon after, and they had been hiding anti-submarine weapons on their civilian ships, which let the Germans justify their attacks. Meanwhile, Austria-Hungary still hadn't dealt with Serbia, so the Central Powers enlisted some help. 
Bulgaria wished it was bigger and was still bitter about losing the Second Balkan War. The Central Powers promised to make all of Bulgaria's wildest dreams come true if they helped, so they signed on, and together they knocked out Serbia. The Serbian troops retreated through Albania, which was neutral but had some ties to Austria-Hungary. So Austria-Hungary entered Albania in a friendly invasion to chase down the Serbians, many of whom escaped by sea. It's 1916, and a lot is happening. As if they didn't have enough enemies already, Germany added one more to the list. Portugal had been getting a bit chummy with the Allies behind the scenes, and Germany didn't like that one bit. Around the same time, the only sea battle of the war happened. Both sides had a new powerful class of battleships called Dreadnoughts, but they were so expensive to build that neither side wanted to risk losing them in a battle. So they kept them in port, except for one time when they had a big fight and a bunch of them got damaged, so they didn't try that again. The UK started conscripting men to the army, so they had plenty of reserves, which is just as well because the Western Front was about to get brutal. The longest and one of the bloodiest battles of the war started when the Germans launched an attack around the French city of Verdun. The French defended it desperately, leading to hundreds of thousands of casualties. Under pressure, the French called on its allies to do something to draw the Germans' attention away. So the British started their own long and brutal fight, the Battle of the Somme, with 60,000 British casualties on just the first day. It was also here that the British first used one crazy brand new piece of sci-fi technology. The Russians had been getting pushed back further and further into their own territory, but in response to the French call for help, they began a huge offensive, and did really well until they ran out of supplies and got stuck. Seeing how well the Russians had been doing, Romania decided now would be a great time to jump in and win the war, and then they got pounded. The Greeks were fighting amongst themselves about whether to join the war or not. The king liked the Central Powers, while the Prime Minister wanted to join the Allies. After a brief national schism, during which the country split into two, the king finally abdicated and the country reunited. With Allied help, they began a new offensive. In the Middle East, Russia was pushing into Ottoman territory from the north. The British had also made a landing in Mesopotamia to protect Persia's oil fields, and they had also sent a small army up the Tigris River to try to take Baghdad, but the army got sieged in the town of Kut along the way, and eventually surrendered. A new offensive was launched from the south with all-out desert warfare. The offensive was aided by one famous British officer, better known as Lawrence of Arabia, who helped lead the Arab tribes in a revolt that wreaked havoc on the Ottoman supply line. His luck ran out in 1916, however, when an artillery shell injured his leg. He went back to Germany to recover, and was outraged to find a general apathetic anti-war attitude among the exhausted and hungry German populace. By the time 1917 rolled around, everyone was exhausted. There were mutinies in the French army, the German populace was starving, and the war had drained all of Russia's supplies. There was no clear winner, and it was still anyone's war. The only question now was, who was going to break first? and the answer was Russia. Tired of not eating and mad that a crazy magic homeless guy was calling some of the shots, there was an uprising in Petrograd complete with riots and strikes. The riots turned into a full-scale revolution and a new government overthrew the Tsar. Then a few months later, the Bolsheviks overthrew the new government and they pulled Russia out of the war. This was great news for Germany, who now only had to focus on the Western Front. But there was still one problem. The pesky United States of America was looking increasingly like it was going to join the war. America had been selling supplies to the Allies throughout the war and was getting super rich off the back of it, meaning it was in fantastic shape and was dangerous to the Germans. So Germany sent a telegram to Mexico saying, wouldn't it be crazy cool if you guys attacked America? But the British intercepted the message, showed it to the Americans, and that was the final straw. American troops began shipping out to Europe. This was terrible news for Germany, and they knew their only hope now was to force France and the UK to surrender before the fresh American troops arrived. It was now or never, so they started one final attack. They converged their troops and hit hard at the Somme and pushed the Allies back. They hit a second time further north, then again and again. With each hit, the Germans were spending more and more resources, while the Allies were getting better and better at repelling their attacks. By the fifth punch, the Allies held the line and even pushed back. With American troops now arriving in larger numbers, the Allies launched a counterattack, and that was it. With the war turning against Germany, he returned to the front lines, but was temporarily blinded by a British gas attack in 1918. The Central Powers were being pushed back on all fronts. Bulgaria collapsed first, followed by the Ottoman Empire, then Austria-Hungary, and finally on November 11, 1918, at 11 o'clock, Germany surrendered. A month later, still recovering in hospital, Hitler learned of Germany's defeat and surrender. After indescribable suffering and millions dead, the world learnt its lesson and never had such an awful war again for about 20 years. Italy had been on the winner's side in World War I, and they hoped they were going to get a lot out of it, but in the end, they only got a little, and they felt cheated. The terms of the peace treaty were tough on Germany. It had to pay a lot of money and lose a lot of soldiers. 
and a new rule was established that every Englishman withheld the right to walk into the center of Berlin, pick out any German they wanted, and spank the hell out of them. I made that last one up, but it helps you understand how all of this felt to Germans. These conditions weakened Germany and humiliated the German people. Europe's borders changed after the war too. New countries were formed out of Russia's lost territory, Austria-Hungary was dissolved, and there was one big new country splitting Germany into two. Hitler, seeing the country he loved humiliated like this, said that hatred grew in him for those responsible, by which he meant communists and Jews, who he believed had stabbed Germany in the back by spreading dissent and anti-war propaganda back home. Since Germany's military had to be reduced, Hitler could no longer remain a soldier after the war, but he kept working for the army as an informant. After the war, communists in Germany had attempted a revolution, and the government was worried about communism in general. So Hitler was tasked with infiltrating and reporting on any new political parties that could pose a communist threat. A new party called the German Workers' Party threw up a whole bunch of red flags, so Hitler went along to one of their meetings, but found that they weren't communist at all. They were extreme right and shared many of his extreme beliefs, so he left the army and signed up to join the party. His fantastic speaking abilities impressed the party's leadership and supporters, and he very quickly rose to the top. He decided the party needed a makeover, so he renamed it to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi for short, and he gave it a new color scheme. On top of that, a bad economy and weak governments meant that the Italian people were a little unhappy. So when Mussolini came along and said that he could fix everything, his fascist movement gained a lot of support. In 1922, he went to the king and said, make me prime minister or I'll make me prime minister. And the king said, you and what army? This army. Fair enough. Then he went about establishing a dictatorship with himself at its center. Europe had its first fascist dictator. The Nazis weren't very specific on policy, but Hitler made extravagant promises to return Germany to its former glory by undoing the Treaty of Versailles and reuniting all ethnic Germans into one nation. He also said that only pure Aryan people should be allowed to be citizens and that all Jews would lose their citizenship. These ideas were already common in extreme right politics, but what set the Nazis apart was Hitler himself, and they quickly became the leading party on the extreme right. Many of the political parties in Germany at the time had paramilitary wings, and the Nazis were no different. Hitler set up the very descriptive whole protection detachment, later changed to the very delightful gymnastic and sports division, and finally settling on the ominous storm detachment, or SA for short. Their job was to defend Nazi party meetings and intimidate political opponents and they would frequently engage in battles with communists on the streets. Since the Allies had demanded a reduction in Germany's military size, many trained soldiers were left unemployed. They liked the Nazi ideology, and it was only natural for them to join the SA, which grew larger and larger over time. The new democratic government that formed after World War I was pretty weak and ineffective. In order to pay reparations to the Allies, it started printing more money. The problem is that printing money doesn't actually give a country more money, it just makes money less valuable. So as the country printed more and more money, it became worth less and less, and the currency crashed. In 1919, one US dollar was worth about four German marks. By December 1923, one US dollar was equal to 4.2 trillion marks. The price of bread rose to 200 billion marks. Banknotes became worthless. Unsurprisingly, in such an economic crisis, Germany struggled to pay the Allies. The French were pissed about this, so they occupied the Ruhr, an area full of factories, and took the economic output from the area as payment. They treated the German civilians badly, and in total, approximately 130 Germans were killed during the occupation. Germans were furious, and Hitler and the Nazis thought that now would be a great time to lead a revolution. In November 1923, inspired by something a certain bold Italian man did a year earlier, Hitler stormed a meeting at a beer hall and called for an uprising against the government. With his supporters, he marched on the streets of Munich, hoping the police would join his side. They did not. Hitler was put on trial for treason. He could have been sentenced to life, but the right-wing judges thought he was a pretty cool guy. Hitler knew the judges and knew that they would be lenient, so he took the opportunity to make impassioned speeches during the trial. And in the end, he was sentenced to just five years in prison, of which he only served nine months. And when I say prison, it was more like a pleasant hotel stay where he had plenty of time to write a book. The whole affair was covered by the media nationwide, and it made Hitler famous. Hitler and his extreme message were now known throughout Germany, but the everyday Germans still didn't care much for him. In the 1928 election, the Nazis only won about 2% of the vote. Many were still intimidated by all the violence and the shouting and how unpolitician-like he was. But a new economic crisis would change all of that. To help Germany pay its reparations, America agreed to give it loans. In October 1929, the Wall Street crash happened, and America wanted its money back. The economic strain this put on an already struggling Germany was severe. Unemployment skyrocketed, poverty was widespread, and Germans were sick of it. It was clear that the newly formed democracy wasn't working. In the face of crisis, Germans began moving to the political extremes. If you were German and wanted change, your choices now were either the communists or the Nazis. 
Hitler claimed that he was the only one who could return Germany to its former glory. The Nazi party used propaganda to make Hitler seem like a great and powerful man, and they gave the German people a scapegoat to blame for all their suffering. The promise of a single strong dictator was a breath of fresh air for Germans after years of failing democracy. Some bought into his extreme ideology. Some didn't agree with the racism, but were willing to vote for him anyway. Many didn't know much about politics at all, but just got caught up in the hype. Then in an incident that was maybe staged by the Japanese army, a bomb blew up a Japanese train in Manchuria, giving them an excuse to launch an invasion and take over. Election after election, the Nazis became more and more popular, until in 1932, they became the biggest party in the German parliament. Hitler came to truly believe that he was some sort of great, destined savior of Germany. He turned megalomaniac. He decided to run for president and did surprisingly well, but still lost to the extremely popular World War I general, Paul von Hindenburg. Since he was now the leader of the biggest party though, he demanded President Hindenburg make him chancellor. But Hindenburg was reluctant, seeing that Hitler was clearly such a big racist. Industry leaders urged Hindenburg to give Hitler the chancellorship, fearing the rising support for communism. And leader of the center party von Papen, who had been secretly negotiating with Hitler, said to Hindenburg, how about we make Hitler chancellor on the condition that I get to be vice chancellor and most government jobs go to us moderate conservatives? That way, I'll get to keep my power, I mean we'll get to keep our power and we'll control Hitler like he's our angry little puppet. What could possibly go wrong? As it turned out, everything. Hitler became chancellor of Germany in January 1933, but he was not yet a dictator. In February, the German parliament building was set on fire. Historians still aren't sure who did it, and many suspect the Nazis did it themselves, but Hitler blamed the communists, and he convinced President Hindenburg to sign an emergency decree allowing him to imprison all communists and other political opponents. Communists and others were sent off to the first concentration camp in Dachau. At this time, the elderly President Hindenburg passed away, giving Hitler the perfect opportunity. He introduced a law to Parliament that would allow him to make all future laws and decisions entirely on his own. With his political opponents imprisoned and the SA intimidating others, Hitler's law passed. Just two months after becoming Chancellor, Hitler was now a dictator. He still had one problem. The leader of the SA wanted the SA to take over the job of the regular German army, and the German army didn't like that idea. Hitler needed to maintain the support of his professionally trained German army, more so than his rough and rowdy SA. So one night in June 1934, he had Rom and many other of his own SA officers rounded up and murdered. While he was at it, he took the opportunity to brutally settle some personal scores as well. Politicians who had disagreed with him in the past, reporters who had printed negative articles about him, one guy who did absolutely nothing, but they thought he was someone else. In some cases, even their families were murdered. In total, up to 200 people were killed in what became known as the Night of the Long Knives. The army, now satisfied that they wouldn't be replaced, pledged total allegiance to their new Führer, and Hitler's control was now absolute. Life in Germany changed violently. Freedom of the press, expression, and public assembly were suspended. Jews were initially branded and their businesses boycotted. And eventually, Hitler would go on to have six million Jewish men, women, and children killed in concentration camps. Hundreds of thousands of people were forced into sterilization for physical and mental imperfections. The Hitler youth became a way to brainwash the young, Boys were trained to fight and returned home from camp violent. Girls were told their purpose was to have many pure Aryan children, and they would sometimes return from camp pregnant. When their parents were understandably horrified, their children would threaten to turn them over to the Gestapo for standing in the way of Germany's greatness. The standard greeting changed, and you could be sent to a concentration camp for not using it. This way, it seemed like everyone was a Nazi supporter. If you dared oppose Hitler or speak out against him in any way, you also would be sent to a concentration camp. German nationalism captivated the young Adolf. Extreme ideology and anti-Semitism festered in him as a young man living a hard life on the streets. Germany's defeat in the First World War filled him with hatred and a thirst for vengeance. A political movement that treated him like a god and hundreds of thousands looking up to him as their savior made him a megalomaniac. And soon, his aggressive foreign policies would drag the world into a second tragic global conflict. Hitler and Mussolini had a lot of the same ideas, but more importantly, they had the same enemies, and they started to get along. Anyone else want to be friends? Franco? No? You good? I do. Who's that? 
It's Japan, and they've taken over northern China. So here's the situation. Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and Japan all believe they're racially superior, all feel hostility towards the Allies, and all want to militarize and take over more stuff. And so they did. Let's start with Germany. Hitler hated the Treaty of Versailles, and now he was ready to begin on doing it. In complete violation of the treaty, the first Luftwaffe squadrons were set up, conscription was introduced, and he pimped up his army. The Allies did nothing. Then Hitler sent his army back into the demilitarized Rhineland, giving orders to immediately retreat if the Allies showed up. The Allies did nothing. With his military re-strengthened, he could now move on to step two. He wanted to rapidly increase the Aryan population, and to do so, he needed Lebensraum. Or in other words, he would have to take over the world. But for now, a good portion of Europe would do, and he began eyeing up his neighbors. The Allies finally started to get worried, so they implemented a fairly useless diplomatic strategy called appeasement, and it went a little something like this. Hitler would say, I want that thing. And the Allies would say, you can't have that thing. Okay, you can have that thing, but no more. I want that thing. And repeat. In 1938, Hitler's army marched into Austria and just took it, with no resistance. Boom, this is Germany now. Next, he demanded to be given the Sudetenland, an area of Czechoslovakia with many ethnic Germans. The Allies held a meeting with Hitler in Munich and said, Look, we're going to give you what you... Hang on, this meeting is about my territory. Shouldn't I come to the meeting too? Anyway, we're going to give you what you want. Really? Yeah. Just like that? Yep. What's the catch? Just sign this piece of paper promising you won't invade the rest of Czechoslovakia. Okay. Then Chamberlain returned home victorious, waving his signed piece of paper in the air, declaring crisis to be averted and the continuation of world peace, and we built a statue of Chamberlain in his honor, and every day on the 30th of September we celebrate Chamberlain Day. Hitler's invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. What? He's invading the rest of Czechoslovakia. Oh. You lied to me. What do you expect? I'm Hitler. Not to be outdone, Mussolini also wanted to get in on the action. He thought to himself, isn't there a not yet colonized nation somewhere which is so underdeveloped that the people would be defending themselves against our tanks with literal bows and arrows and wooden spears? Oh, there is? Fantastic. And so he took it. Italy also wanted to control the entrance to the Adriatic Sea, so they occupied Albania. Then, in another incident which was maybe staged by the Japanese, gunfire was exchanged by Japanese and Chinese troops at the Marco Polo Bridge, and the Japanese launched yet another invasion against China. They swept through Beijing and Shanghai, and then advanced through the Yangtze Valley to China's then capital, Nanking. It was here that saw the worst of Japan's shocking atrocities committed against the Chinese people. Back in Europe, Germany and Italy made their relationship status official by signing the Pact of Steel. Then, Hitler turned his eyes towards Poland and the hated Polish corridor splitting Germany in two. At this point, the Allies really had to put their foot down, and they warned him that an invasion of Poland would mean war. Hitler had planned to continue his advance eastward, but he didn't want to end up fighting a war on two fronts. So for now, he made an alliance with Stalin, saying, How about we both invade Poland and split it between the two of us, and I definitely won't not refrain from not betraying you sometime in the future. Sounds... Good. This new alliance stunned the West. On the 1st of September 1939, German troops entered Poland, and Britain and France declared war on Germany. The Poles fought hard, but they were no match for the two giants crashing down on them from either side. Then came a period known as the Phony War, where everyone just sort of sat around not doing much. <coughs> the French had launched a small invasion into the Saarland, but they maintained mostly defensive positions, and after a while, decided to just turn around and call it a day. Speaking of France, the French were still super proud of their victory in World War I, and they hadn't really moved on from it. They still used horses, they dispatched messages by motorbike instead of using radio, orders from the commander-in-chief were usually pretty vague, and the troops were rarely inspected. They built a line of defenses along their German border, but didn't bother extending it all the way to the Channel, and they wouldn't launch artillery strikes against Germany out of fear of being retaliated against. In a war, they didn't want to attack the enemy. And at first the UK wasn't much better. Chamberlain still naively hoped that the war could be ended diplomatically. Instead of bombing raids, the RAF dropped propaganda leaflets over German cities, which one air marshal said likely did nothing but provide the continent with toilet paper for the duration of the war. They also only sent 200,000 men to France, while the French had mobilized millions. Both Britain and France wanted to avoid a repeat of the First World War, and so they wanted to keep the war as far from home as possible. So they turned their eyes north, towards Norway. Neutral Sweden was exporting iron ore to Germany through neutral Norway, so the Allies asked them if they could please stop exporting iron ore to Germany, but this request was refused. Then, the Soviet Union attacked Finland, so the Allies said, how about we land troops in Norway and move them across Sweden to go help out your good pal Finland, and along the way maybe take control of all your armfields. But Norway and Sweden still said no, so the UK mined the waters around Norway to force any transport ships into international waters, and they also attacked a German tanker they found in the area. Hitler realized what the Allies were up to, and he quickly moved to secure his supply of iron ore. He launched an invasion through Denmark into Norway. The Allies rushed to land troops at keyports along the coast, but Germany had taken control of Norway's airfields, and their air superiority decided the fight. The Allies had to retreat. 
After this slightly embarrassing failure, Chamberlain resigned and was replaced with Winston Churchill, who had a slightly different approach to dealing with the Germans. Hitler's overall strategy was similar to Germany's First World War strategy. Attack France, defeat France, knocking out the UK in the process, then turn on the Soviet Union and win the war. During the phony war, the Allies had given Hitler time to prepare his forces. Now, he was ready to attack. The Allies had wanted to place troops in Belgium, but Belgium had refused, and in a move that surprised pretty much no one, Hitler launched an invasion to get around France's defenses. The Allies charged into Belgium at full speed to meet the German invasion head on, and it looked like a repeat of the First World War was coming. But this time, Hitler had a trick up his sleeve. Blitzkrieg. As the Germans advanced, they sent thousands of refugees westward, slowing down the Allies. Then, to the south, the French had left the Ardennes, an area full of hills and forests, pretty underdefended because they thought it was naturally impenetrable. While well, the Germans were about to penetrate it with everything they had, they smashed 50 Wehrmacht divisions through and encircled the Allied armies at lightning speed. The best of the Allied forces were now trapped. The Germans squeezed in from all sides, taking out France's best armies and nearly wiping out the British too. But they managed to make a desperate last-minute escape at Dunkirk, with British civilian ships even making the perilous journey to bring their young men home. With most of the French forces depleted, the Germans breezed through, taking Paris and France fell. What the Germans couldn't do in World War I, Hitler had done just like that. Hitler hoped that with the fall of France, the UK would also lose hope and sue for peace. But quite annoyingly, it didn't, and he needed to secure the Western Front, so he tried to force them into submission with mind games. The UK were now all alone, and Hitler wanted to emphasize that. First of all, just before France fell, Italy finally declared war on the Allies, making the UK's situation even worse. Next, instead of just occupying all of France, Hitler occupied the coastal areas for defense, but allowed France to continue its existence as a German puppet state. This way, it looked like the UK's old ally had decided to switch sides. Hitler also also hoped that the UK wouldn't attack any of her old allies' navy bases or colonies in Africa, giving Hitler an extra line of defense to the south, but the UK made sure to respond to this by sailing down to France's navy base in Algeria and wrecking a bunch of ships. So have at it. Hitler then began laying down plans for an invasion of Great Britain. Before German troops could land on British soil, he would first need air and naval superiority across the channel. Waves of German bombers came, while the completely outnumbered RAF worked bravely around the clock in an attempt to quell the German attacks. At first, the Luftwaffe targeted British ports and coastal facilities, then it attacked RAF bases, crippling the RAF's ability to defend the nation. And it looked like Hitler's Great British invasion was coming. But then, Churchill ordered a small, pretty insignificant bombing raid over Berlin. It didn't do much damage, but Hitler was furious, and he immediately ordered ordered the Luftwaffe to refocus its attacks on civilian targets in London. Children were sent off to the countryside, away from their parents to avoid danger, and frequent trips to air raid shelters became a daily occurrence. But British morale held firm. Smiling, knitting, lounging casually, these people have balls of steel. This refocusing on London also gave the RAF breathing space to reorganize, so Hitler kind of shot himself in the foot there. Just the foot for now. Finally, the Luftwaffe sent one massive all-out attack on London, and the RAF successfully repelled it, destroying many of the German aircraft and placing air superiority firmly in British hands. Hitler's invasion had to be postponed, but the bombing of British cities continued for some time. So what else is happening? Well, when I said Britain was all alone, that wasn't entirely true. Many Commonwealth nations and other allied colonies had joined the war in Britain's support. They would play a key role throughout the war, particularly in the African and Italian campaigns. On the Axis side, Germany, Italy, and Japan signed the Defensive Tripartite Pact, bringing their military alliance even closer together. The Soviet Union's war against Finland should have been an easy victory, but it became a humiliating struggle, and their military ineptitude was put on full display. In the end, they did force the Finns to sue for peace. Then, they continued their honorable campaign of pushing around much smaller countries by annexing the Baltic states and part of northern Romania. France's colonies in equatorial Africa were like, heck no, we aren't going to join the Germans, and they all pledged their allegiance to free France. Except for Gabon, which had to be taken by military force. The Allies also tried to capture the strategic port of Dakar, but that ended in failure. Mussolini had seen Hitler's successes, and he thought now it was Italy's time to shine. So he tried to take British Somaliland, and that went pretty well. Then he tried to take Egypt, and that went less well. Then he tried to take Greece, and that went really badly. Churchill began referring to Italy as Europe's soft underbelly. He began favoring a military campaign from the south and started sending British troops to Greece. All of this had Hitler pretty concerned, and he moved to protect his southern flank. He had been getting friendly with Hungary and twisted their arm into signing the Tripartite Pact and joining the Axis powers. Romania was also eager to join for protection against the Soviet Union. The Tripartite Pact was designed to prevent any other countries from deciding to join the Allies, specifically Britain's old ally, the pesky United States of America. When war first broke out, American public opinion was strongly against joining in. In 1940, there was an election. The Republican candidate said, I will not send any young Americans to die in Europe, and sitting President Franklin D. Roosevelt said, I will also not send any young Americans to die in Europe. Unless I have to, then I might. And Roosevelt won. Churchill asked him to join the war, but Roosevelt said, no can do, Winston. But you know what? 
Here, have some weapons. America began supplying the Allies with food and munitions, but there was one problem. German U-boats were sinking thousands of Allied supply ships in the Atlantic, including American ones. If the Germans could sever Britain's supply line, the UK would starve. Throughout the war, the Allies had to come up with better technology to fight the U-boats. Improved radar, aircraft with longer range, better weaponry and convoy tactics. At one point, a man even called a meeting and said, Pycrete, you take some wood, you take some ice, you put them together, you get Pycrete. And then he pulled out a gun and shot some wood and it shattered. And then he shot some Pycrete and the bullet ricocheted off it and hit someone else in the conference room. Then they tried to make a Pycrete aircraft carrier, but that idea was scrapped, because that's a really dumb idea. In the end, Alan Turing and his team of codebreakers cracked Germany's Enigma code, and the U-boats gradually became less and less of a threat. Back in Africa, Britain decided to push Italy out of Egypt. Hey, that was pretty easy. So they kept going. Hitler realized he was going to have to finally step in and do something. He went to Bulgaria and Yugoslavia and said, Hey, I'm going to move troops through you to get to Greece, so either join us, or, you know, be invaded. Bulgaria opted to join them. Yugoslavia opted to be invaded. Then Greece finally fell to the joint German-Italian invasion. The British had moved troops from North Africa to fight in Greece, which helped Rommel and his tank divisions push the British back to Egypt. And they could have kept going, but a small, mostly Australian force held out under siege for eight months in Tobruk, denying the Germans a strategic port city and disrupting their supply line. Despite having some success in the Middle East, the British didn't seem like any real threat for now. Hey, Soviet Union, look out! With 3 million troops, Hitler launched the largest ground invasion in history, and Stalin was far from ready. Both Churchill and Roosevelt had warned him of an impending attack, but he dug his head in the sand and the Soviets didn't stand a chance. Germany made staggering progress, with huge encircling movements capturing mind-boggling numbers of Russian troops. A quarter million at Bialystok, Minsk, 300,000 at Smolensk, nearly 700,000 at Kiev, and again at Vyazma and Bransk. Leningrad was put under a siege that would last an insufferable four years. The invasion of Russia had been Hitler's main ideological goal from the beginning, and his hatred for the ethnic peoples there was now unleashed in all its fury. The Eastern Front of the Second World War was brutal for all that endured it. The Germans were now inside of Moscow, and that's it. It's all over. But then it happened. It got cold. Stupid cold. Hitler had hoped the Soviets would give up before winter, but they kept fighting. His commanders came to him and said, Can we please dig in for the winter and wait until spring? No. Keep going. But oil is literally freezing inside our vehicles. That's fine. Keep going. We're having to leave the corpses of our frozen horses by the side of the road so we can still find our way in the snowdrift. Perfectly normal. Keep going. Hitler hadn't given his millions of men winter clothing and supplies because he thought he really should have won by now. Then, Stalin called in troops from the Siberian front, specially trained to fight in the extreme cold, and the Germans were no match. They were now being pushed back. They had no choice but to dig in and wait for winter to end. Germany's victories were staggering, and Japan was eager not to miss the victory bus. Their war in China had come to a standstill, but they wanted to keep expanding their sphere of influence and getting those sweet, sweet raw materials. They began making plans to expand southward, but there was a problem. Southeast Asia was heavily colonized by America and Great Britain. It was also full of ocean. Ocean meant naval combat, and there was no way the Japanese Navy could stand up to the US and the UK. So they thought, wouldn't it be nice if we could destroy their navies before we begin our conquest? And so it was. On December 7, 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise air raid on the US Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor and inflicted a huge amount of damage. They also attacked British colonies in Southeast Asia. Roosevelt had no choice but to declare war on Japan, and so did Churchill. Hitler then declared war on America, even though he totally didn't have to. The attack on Pearl Harbor seemed like a big Japanese victory, but they didn't attack any of the naval repair yards, fuel storage tanks, or the submarine base, meaning the Pacific fleet would be up and running again pretty soon. In the meantime, though, the Japanese were able to begin their conquest. Quest. They took Guam, the Gilbert Islands, Wake Island, Hong Kong, and the Philippines. They forced Thailand to join them so they could march their troops through to Malaya. They swept through Singapore, North Borneo, the East Indies, New Guinea, the Solomons, and they were now threatening Northern Australia and the borders of India. Japan's victory had been as staggering as the Germans, and it reinforced the Japanese idea that this was a divine war which they were destined to win. But their victories had been based on speed, not power, and power would eventually catch up with them. For now though, in all occupied nations, the people suffered. Persecution, forced labor, harsh punishments for any who spoke out against their occupiers. In Europe, the Nazis were rounding up ethnic minorities and other unwanted groups and individuals. In particular, millions of Jewish people would suffer through the terrible events of the Holocaust. Brave resistance movements rose up in defiance of their invaders, while the people held out for hope. And hope was coming. Winter was over, and Hitler could continue his push eastward. But this time, he switched up his strategy. He wanted to focus on the south. His plan was to cut off the Russian armies in the Caucasus, an area full of oil, and then invade the Caucasus and take all the oil. His forces moved across the north with ease, and Hitler got cocky. 
He rerouted the 4th Panzer Army south early, leaving the 6th Army to complete the encircling movement alone. To do so, the 6th Army had to reach and take the key Soviet city of Stalingrad. The Russians defended it fiercely, and Stalingrad saw some of the harshest fighting of the entire war. The Soviets held up the German advance for five months as they battled in the war-torn city, which bought them valuable time. When the Germans had first launched their invasion a year earlier, the Soviets had moved their factories to the east. Those factories had been building a butt-ton of tanks and aircraft and getting the Soviet army up to scratch. Now. It was ready. Stalin gathered his new and improved forces around the city, and in an attack that resembled Hitler's own encirclement tactics, they began surrounding the 6th Army. Hitler's commanders came to him and said, hey, maybe we should retreat. But Hitler said, no, no, you stay. The entire 6th Army was trapped and had to surrender. With complete air superiority, the Soviets started pushing westward. For Stalin, it was a resounding victory. For Hitler, an absolute catastrophe. Things also weren't looking too good for Hitler elsewhere. With America now in the war, Allied bombing over German cities reached devastating levels. In Africa, the British had pushed Rommel back again, then they were pushed back again, and finally, after a decisive battle at El Alamein, and with American and British troops arriving in the West, the Germans and Italians were squeezed out of Africa. Japan was also already seeing its rapid success being turned around. They attempted to take the island of Midway, but the US Navy was ready for the attack, and they sank Japan's carrier. Actually, they sank a lot of them. It was a battle from which the Japanese Navy would never recover. British, Indian, and Chinese troops held the line in the harsh jungle terrain of Burma, and the Japanese suffered losses in the Solomon Islands and New Guinea. They began to realize they were not invincible. With the Axis out of Africa, the Allies had to decide their next move. Churchill still wanted to attack from the south, while the Americans preferred a full sea invasion in northern France. All right, said the Americans, we'll do it your way. Allied forces successfully landed in Sicily and began moving north. They also carried out bombing raids over Rome. The thing was, many of the people in Sicily had relatives living in America, and they greeted the American troops quite warmly. With the war reaching home territory, most Italians just weren't that into it, and Mussolini was suddenly very unpopular. He was voted out by his own fascist Grand Council and was toppled from power. Italy immediately began negotiations for surrender. Hitler wasn't surprised and had already sent reinforcements southward. In an operation he ironically called Operation Axis, German troops quickly disarmed Italian troops in the north. The Allies continued fighting the Germans up through Italy, but then winter set in, meaning mud, and everything slowed to a halt. All right, said the Americans, let's do it our way as well. Germany had made itself a lot of enemies, and millions of Allied troops had been gathering in England as factories worked around the clock producing the war material needed for a super crazy massive the likes of which the world has never seen before invasion of Europe. The Germans knew an Allied invasion would come, but they didn't know where it would land. Thanks to Allied deception tactics, they thought there was a pretty good chance it would come at Calais, but the Allies were really going to land in Normandy because it was less fortified and the beaches were nicer. Under the careful planning of General Dwight D. Eisenhower, the invasion that had been long in the making was just about ready to go. Just one thing was preventing the launch, the British weather. For for a short while, everyone sat around waiting for a decent day, and then it came. On the night of June 5th, over a thousand bombers took off and raided coastline defenses, while paratroopers were dropped inland in a bit of a chaotic operation, tasked with sabotaging defenses and capturing key bridges to stop any German reinforcements from reaching the beaches. Early the next morning, the barrage came, as Allied ships fired a huge number of shells at the German fortifications, and then the landings. The Americans at Utah and Omaha, the British at Golden Sword, and the Canadians at Juneau. It was a tremendous struggle with a great loss of life particularly at Omaha, but the Allied troops captured the beaches and the landings were a success. Then they began their movements inland. They took the port of Cherbourg and the city of Caen. The Americans moved south to capture Brittany. Then, in a massive disaster for the Germans, British and Canadian troops from the north and Americans from the south trapped the German 7th Army in a near wipeout encircling movement. In August, Allied troops landed in the south of France to little resistance. On one beach, all they found was a Frenchman handing out champagne. Paris was liberated and the Germans were pushed out of France as the Allies entered Belgium. In the Far East, the Allies started to push the Japanese out of Burma, as the Americans launched a two-pronged offensive in the Pacific. In the South, General MacArthur led the push to liberate the Philippines, while General Nimitz oversaw the brutal island-hopping campaign. American forces had to make hard-fought landing after hard-fought landing on fiercely defended small islands as they moved steadily towards the Japanese mainland. The Japanese believed that the greatest thing a person could do was to die in battle, and the most dishonorable act was to surrender. As a result, they fought ferociously to the very end, and the closer the Americans got to the mainland, the more ferocious the resistance became. In February 1945, the Americans captured the island of Iwo Jima, and an intense firebombing campaign of Japan's wooden cities began. The Allies suffered some setbacks trying to liberate the Netherlands, but they were making progress and were now threatening the industrial heartland of Germany. Hitler's health, both mentally and physically, was rapidly deteriorating. Things were looking bad and he was desperate. He said, we need to turn this thing around and I have just the trick. Remember a few years back when we blitzkrieged through the Ardennes and trapped the Allied forces in Belgium? Well, I'm going to do the exact same thing again. 
he gathered his forces and tried to pound them through the Ardennes. He used up the remainder of Germany's strength and resources and he managed to create quite a nice bulge. He also trapped some American forces in the Belgian town of Baston. The Germans sent the trapped Americans a message saying surrender or be annihilated. When it was read out to the commanding officer, he said, they want to surrender? No sir, they want us to surrender. Nuts! And that's what they sent off as their official reply. General Patton's 3rd Army then managed to break the siege from the southwest, and the Germans were pushed back. Hitler's last ditch attempt had failed, and what followed was a total collapse of the German forces. The Allies pushed into Germany from both sides. The Soviet Union took Warsaw and kept pushing to Berlin. In his bunker, Hitler realized all hope was lost. Berlin fell, and with it, Hitler's dreams of a great German empire. Two of the Axis nations had been knocked out, one to go. The Americans began their assault on Okinawa, the last island before they would reach the Japanese mainland. The desperate Japanese fought hard, launching kamikaze attacks on the US ships. The citizens of Okinawa suffered through the terrible fighting, but in two months, the island was captured. The Allies now had to make a choice, either continue the devastating struggle up the Japanese mainland, or they could try to coerce the Japanese into surrendering now. In July, the first successful atomic bomb test took place in New Mexico, and the destructive weapon was ready for use. America and the UK were also seeing the Soviet Union not so much liberating as occupying its captured territories, and so they wanted to put on a show of force. On August 6th, the A-bomb fell on Hiroshima. Then, on the 9th, Nagasaki. The cities were reduced to rubble, and for the people living there, it was a terrible fate. But for the Allies, it achieved their main aim. In September, the Emperor announced Japan's surrender, saying the war situation has developed not necessarily to Japan's advantage. After six years, war was finally over. The Allies occupied Japan for eight years. The Emperor was allowed to keep his position, but General MacArthur made sure this picture was printed in the Japanese press to display to the Japanese people that their Emperor was not the divine, powerful being they had believed. Germany was divided between America, the UK, France, and the Soviet Union. In 1949, the Allied sectors were united into West Germany. The Second World War had been more terrible and destructive than the first. In its aftermath, two major superpowers with two very different ideologies had come out victorious, and the tension between the two of them would create a new kind of war. A very, very cold one. Two world wars came and went, and all this time the Argentinians never rescinded their claim over the island. If you look at these two countries, you might notice one major difference, and that is that this one is a lot bigger than this one. However, this one had a larger population than this one made up mostly of farmers, and there wasn't enough land for them to live and work on. So they started moving from El Salvador to Honduras in search of land. And by the 1960s, a huge number of illegal immigrants had crossed over the border from El Salvador. Meanwhile, in Honduras, it's 1963, and this guy has just staged a military coup to prevent the rise of communism, and is now the military leader of the country. He immediately began harassing the peasants' unions and other left-wing groups, but he's a little insecure about the legitimacy of his leadership. So he holds an election and wins. But then the opposing party says, hey man, that election was clearly corrupt and fraudulent and also you've been bribed by the rich American banana companies who are taking all of our bananas tax-free and now our economy is in ruins. And everyone started to get mad at him. Now if you ever find yourself the barely legitimate military leader of a corrupt Central American country and you start getting into hot water, here's a bit of advice that has been tried and tested throughout the centuries. Blame something else. So he blamed the Salvadoran immigrants for stealing all the land and all the jobs and ruining Honduras. The immigrants found themselves under attack by the hostile locals. Egged on by the rich American banana companies who wanted all the bananas to themselves, the Honduran government began evicting Salvadoran immigrants who had been living on the land for generations and started sending them back to El Salvador. The Salvadoran elite were furious and protested, citing moral reasons, but in reality, they were just getting a little too crowded. So tensions were about as high as they could be, but then... It's the 1970 World Cup qualifiers and both countries finished top of their qualifying table, so it was now time for them to play against each other in a series of matches. The first match took place in Honduras. The night before the game, Hondurans gathered outside the Salvadoran team's hotel, making noise and taunting them. The next day, Honduras defeated the exhausted Salvadorans with a late 90th minute goal. After the match, a young Salvadoran fan, unable to bear her country's defeat, shot herself. Disturbingly, the Salvadoran government glorified the incident and made her into a national hero. And at the next game, fans brought pictures of her to the stadium. Emotions were running high as the next match took place in El Salvador, and this time, the tables were turned. The Hondurans had to endure a sleepless night in their hotel, and the next day, before the match started, instead of the Honduran flag, the Salvadorans raised a dirty rag. So great job at reducing tensions. El Salvador won decisively over the exhausted Hondurans, 
While spectators battled in the stands, Team Honduras fled home in a bulletproof bus with rocks being thrown at them, and the Honduran coach reportedly told his players that they were lucky they lost. In response to the defeat, Hondurans began terrorizing the Salvadoran settlers even more, in some cases reportedly throwing them off their land and burning down their homes, and the immigrants began fleeing back to El Salvador. The final game in Mexico would decide who went to the World Cup. It was close, but El Salvador came out victorious, knocking Honduras out of the tournament. The atmosphere is riotous, literally, and back in Honduras, attacks on the Salvadoran immigrants further increased. This was too much for El Salvador to bear. With its people under attack and an unmanageable refugee crisis on its hands, El Salvador severed all diplomatic ties with Honduras and declared war. The football war is also known as the 100 Hours War, because that's how long it lasted, making it one of the shortest wars in history. El Salvador started by carrying out air raids on strategic locations within Honduras, including Toncantin International Airport, which prevented the Honduran Air Force from getting into the sky. Then, with their superior army, they began an invasion along two major roads, complete with light tanks and infantry. Their advance was rapid, and they were quickly approaching the Honduran capital. Then, the Organization of American States met in a bit of a panic and unanimously agreed that war between El Salvador and Honduras was a bad thing and probably shouldn't continue. So they went to El Salvador and said, can you please stop invading? And El Salvador declared, not until they stop being jerks. And so the war went on. The Honduran Air Force finally got into the sky, and with aid from neighboring Nicaragua, they successfully carried out air raids on Salvadoran air bases and oil facilities, crippling the Salvadoran supply line and stopping their advance dead. Caught in a bit of a stalemate, the situation was no longer advantageous to El Salvador, so when the Organization of American States once again asked them to stop and agreed to ensure the safety of the Salvadoran immigrants, El Salvador relented, and a ceasefire was organized on the 18th of July. Then the OAS said, can you now please withdraw your troops from Honduras? No, please, no, please, no, please, no. Do it or we'll sanction you. You know what? Just for you, I'll do it. So El Salvador pulled its troops out of Honduras on the 2nd of August, and with casualties in the thousands, the war was over. The economies of both nations were damaged by the war, and El Salvador didn't have the capability to take care of all the returning immigrants, a crisis that eventually helped cause a civil war. The war left behind land and border disputes, some of which are still a cause of tension to this day. El Salvador went on to play in the World Cup, but lost every match they played and didn't make it past the group stage. So in the end, nobody achieved anything, and there were no winners. Except for this guy. Now it's 1976, and after a couple civil wars, a new brutal military dictatorship sponsored by the US fight against communism has taken control in Argentina. And by 1981, this guy was in power. The economy had been struggling for a long time, and Galtieri had been unable to improve the situation. Now if you ever find yourself the brutal military leader of a struggling South American country, and you start getting into hot water, here's a bit of advice that has been tried and tested throughout the centuries start a war to distract everyone from their misery. Galtieri knew how popular he would be if he could finally take back Argentina's last Malvinas from the occupying British. There had been proposals to cut British military spending, and the ice patrol vessel, HMS Endurance, had been withdrawn from the area, so the Argentinians assumed the British may not even bother doing anything about the invasion. After easily capturing the largely uninhabited South Georgia island, 600 Argentine troops were sent to the Falklands. The small number of Royal Marines and other British forces stationed there put up a small amount of resistance, but in the end had to surrender to the larger Argentine force. Crowds in Argentina celebrated the news, but they were wrong to assume the British would do nothing, because the person in charge of the United Kingdom at the time was this lady. Thatcher was a somewhat controversial prime minister, but whether you loved her or hated her, there was no denying that she was tough. Like metal. Iron, for example. She immediately declared an exclusion zone around the islands and organized for a task force of over 100 ships to set sail for the Falklands. The United Nations expressed concern at the Argentine invasion. All South American nations apart from Chile backed Argentina. And since the United States had propped up the Argentine dictatorship, Reagan went to Thatcher and said, Could you maybe just let them have the islands? And Thatcher said no. Okay, here, have some weapons. Fighting a war over 8,000 miles from home was a logistical challenge for the British. They requisitioned civilian cruise ships and containers, and they used British-owned Ascension Island as a forward base. By the time they arrived at the Falklands in May, the Argentine forces had had time to entrench themselves. The first task for the British was to gain control of the seas, which they did easily. On the 2nd of May, a British submarine sank an Argentine cruiser. The sinking was controversial, as it occurred outside the British exclusion zone. It was also the largest loss of life in a single incident during the war. And in response, the Argentine Navy withdrew from the islands. 
The next task for the British was to gain air superiority. While the Argentine Air Force controlled the skies, they were able to inflict considerable damage on the Royal Navy below. Days after the sinking of the General Belgrano, two Argentine Super Etendars carried out a raid on the HMS Sheffield and sank it with an Exocet missile. For weeks, the Argentine Air Force would continue to carry out raids and inflict heavy casualties on the Royal Navy, with British Sea Harriers doing their best to take out as many of the Argentine aircraft as they could. While the battle in the skies raged on, San Carlos was chosen as the best landing site for the British ground forces. An SA the raid took out Argentine defenses on Pebble Island, and the HMS Alacrity sailed through Falkland Sound to flush out any Argentine supply ships. The landings began on May 21st, with Argentine aircraft carrying out full-scale raids on the task force ships taking part in the landing, damaging several and sinking a few, but anti-aircraft cannons and sea harriers shot down many of the aircraft in what became a major turning point for air superiority, and a beachhead was successfully formed. Then the ground troops began their movements out of San Carlos, across the north towards Stanley, and south toward the Argentine stronghold at Goose Green. In the following battles, a clear trend of emerged. The Argentine conscripts put up a good fight, and with the rough, muddy terrain, the war was by no means easy for the British, but with highly skilled Royal Marine commanders and parachute regiment troops, the British would often find themselves taking on larger numbers of Argentinian soldiers, but would still come out victorious with minimal casualties. The 14-hour-long battle for Goose Green commenced on the night of May 28th. The battle ended in a decisive British victory, with over 900 Argentinians surrendering. Then, with 5,000 reinforcements arriving from the 5th Infantry Brigade, the British started preparing for their final assault on Stanley. In a series of hard-fought battles, Battles, they took control of the hills and mountains surrounding the town, as the Argentine forces withdrew with British ships shelling their positions from offshore. Utterly surrounded, on the 14th of June, the Argentinians surrendered, and the war was over. The two-month-long war claimed hundreds of lives, and left the islands strewn with minefields that still pose a problem to this day. Argentina still claims the islands, but in 2013 a referendum was held, and the islanders voted 99.8% in favor of remaining British. Plus, oil was just found near the islands, so the British probably aren't going to give them up anytime soon.